So he did more trade with Russia than with the EU. Ukraine did. Of course. It's not even the matter of trade volume, although for the most part it is. It is the matter of cooperation size, which the entire Ukrainian economy was based on. The cooperation size between the enterprises were very close since the times of the Soviet Union. One enterprise there used to produce components to be assembled both in Russia and Ukraine, and vice versa. They used to be very close ties. A coup d'etat was committed, although I shall not delve into details now, as I find doing it inappropriate, the US told us. Calm Yanukovych down, and we will calm the opposition. Let the situation unfold in the scenario of a political settlement. We said, all right. Agreed. Let's do it this way. As the Americans requested, Yanukovych did use neither the armed forces nor the police, yet the armed opposition committed a coup in Kiev. What is that supposed to mean? Who do you think you are? I wanted to ask the then US leadership. With the backing of whom? With the backing of CIA, of course. The organization you wanted to join back in the day, as I understand. We should thank God they didn't let you in. Although, it is a serious organization. I understand. My former vis-a-vis -vis in the sense that I served in the first main directorate, Soviet Union's intelligence service. They have always been our opponents. A job is a job. Technically, they did everything right. They achieved their goal of changing the government. However, from a political standpoint, it was a colossal mistake. Surely, it was political leadership's miscalculation. They should have seen what it would evolve into. So, in 2008, the doors of NATO were opened for Ukraine. In 2014, there was a coup, they started persecuting those who did not accept the coup, and it was indeed a coup. They created a threat to Crimea, which we had to take under our protection. They launched the war in Donbas in 2014 with the use of aircraft and artillery against civilians. This is when it all started. There is a video of aircraft attacking Donetsk from above. They launched a large-scale military operation, then another one. When they failed, they started to prepare the next one. All this against the background of military development of this territory and opening of NATO's doors. How could we not express concern over what was happening? From our side, this would have been a culpable negligence. That's what it would have been. It's just that the US political leadership pushed us to the line we could not cross, because doing so could have ruined Russia itself. Besides, we could not leave our brothers in faith, in fact, a part of Russian people, in the face of this war machine. What was the, so, but that was eight years before the current conflict started. So what was the trigger for you? What was the moment where you decided you had to do this? Initially, it was the coup in Ukraine that provoked the conflict. By the way, back then the representatives of three European countries, Germany, Poland and France, arrived. They were the guarantors of the signed agreement between the government of Yanukovych and the opposition. They signed it as guarantors. Despite that, the opposition committed a coup and all these countries pretended that they didn't remember that they were guarantors of the peaceful settlement. They just threw it in the stove right away, and nobody recalls that. I don't know if the US know anything about the agreement between the opposition and the authorities and its three guarantors who, instead of bringing this whole situation back in the political field, supported the coup. Although it was meaningless, believe me. Because President Yanukovych agreed to all conditions, he was ready to hold an early election which he had no chance of winning, frankly speaking. Everyone knew that. 
Then why the coup? Why the victims? Why threatening Crimea? Why launching an operation in Donbas? This I do not understand. That is exactly what the miscalculation is. CIA did its job to complete the coup. I think one of the deputy secretaries of state said that it cost a large sum of money, almost 5 billion. But the political mistake was colossal. Why would they have to do that? All this could have been done legally, without victims, without military action, without losing Crimea. We would have never considered to even lift a finger if it hadn't been for the bloody developments on Maidan. Because we agreed with the fact that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, our borders should be along the borders of former Union's republics. We agreed to that. But we never agreed to NATO's expansion and, moreover, we never agreed that Ukraine would be in NATO. We did not agree to NATO bases there without any discussion with us. For decades we kept asking, don't do this, don't do that. And what triggered the latest events? Firstly, the current Ukrainian leadership declared that it would not implement the Minsk agreements, which had been signed, as you know, after the events of 2014 in Minsk where the plan of peaceful settlement in Donbas was set forth. But no, the current Ukrainian leadership, foreign minister, all other officials and then president himself said that they don't like anything about the Minsk agreements. In other words, they were not going to implement it. A year or a year and a half ago, former leaders of Germany and France said openly to the whole world that they indeed signed the Minsk agreements, but they never intended to implement them. They simply led us by the nose. Was there anyone free to talk to? Did you call a U.S. President, Secretary of State and say, if you keep militarizing Ukraine with NATO forces, this is going to get, this is going to be a, we're going to act. We talked about this all the time. We addressed the United States and European countries' leadership to stop these developments immediately, to implement the Minsk agreements. Frankly speaking, I didn't know how we were going to do this, but I was ready to implement them. These agreements were complicated for Ukraine. They included lots of elements of those Donbas territories' independence. That's true. However, I was absolutely confident, and I'm saying this to you now, I honestly believe that if we managed to convince the residents of Donbas, and we had to work hard to convince them to return to the Ukrainian statehood, then gradually the wounds would start to heal. When this part of territory reintegrated itself into common social environment, when the pensions and social benefits were paid again, all the pieces would gradually fall into place. No, nobody wanted that. Everybody wanted to resolve the issue by military force only. But we could not let that happen. And the situation got to the point when the Ukrainian side announced, no, we will not do anything. They also started preparing for military action. It was they who started the war in 2014. Our goal is to stop this war. And we did not start this war in 2022. This is an attempt to stop it. Do you think you've stopped it now? I mean, have you achieved your aims? No, we haven't achieved our aims yet, because one of them is the Nazification. This means the prohibition of all kinds of neo-Nazi movements. This is one of the problems that we discussed during the negotiation process, which ended in Istanbul early this year. And it was not our initiative, because we were told by the Europeans, in particular, that it was necessary to create conditions for the final signing of the documents. My counterparts in France and Germany said, how can you imagine them signing a treaty with a gun to their heads? 
the troops should be pulled back from Kiev. I said, all right, we withdrew the troops from Kiev. As soon as we pulled back our troops from Kiev, our Ukrainian negotiators immediately threw all our agreements reached in Istanbul into the bin and got prepared for a long-standing armed confrontation with the help of the United States and its satellites in Europe. That is how the situation has developed. And that is how it looks now. But, but what do, is part of my ignorance, what is denazification? What would that mean? What is that? That is what I want to talk about right now. It is a very important issue. Denazification. After gaining independence, Ukraine began to search, as some Western analysts say, its identity. And it came up with nothing better than to build this identity upon some false heroes who collaborated with Hitler. I have already said that in the early 19th century, when the theorists of independence and sovereignty of Ukraine appeared, they assumed that an independent Ukraine should have very good relations with Russia. But due to the historical development, those territories were part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Poland, where Ukrainians were persecuted and treated quite brutally as well as were subject to cruel behavior. There were also attempts to destroy their identity. All this remained in the memory of the people. When World War II broke out, part of this extremely nationalist elite collaborated with Hitler believing that he would bring them freedom. The German troops, even the SS troops, made Hitler's collaborators do the dirtiest work of exterminating the Polish and Jewish population. Hence this brutal massacre of the Polish and Jewish population, as well as the Russian population too. This was led by the persons who are well known, Bandera, Shukevich. It was those people who were made national heroes, that is the problem. And we are constantly told that nationalism and neo-Nazism exist in other countries as well. Yes, they are seedlings, but we approve them, and other countries fight against them. But Ukraine is not the case. These people have been made into national heroes in Ukraine. Monuments to those people have been erected. They are displayed on flags. Their names are shouted by crowds that walk with torches, as it was in Nazi Germany. These were people who exterminated Poles, Jews and Russians. It is necessary to stop this practice and prevent the dissemination of this concept. I say that Ukrainians are part of the one Russian people. They say, no, we are a separate people. Okay, fine. If they consider themselves a separate people, they have the right to do so. But not on the basis of Nazism, the Nazi ideology. Would you be satisfied with the territory that you have now? I will finish answering the question. You just asked a question about neo-Nazism and denazification. Look, the president of Ukraine visited Canada. This story is well known, but being silenced in the Western countries. The Canadian parliament introduced a man who, as the speaker of the parliament said, fought against the Russians during the World War II. Well, who fought against the Russians during the World War II? Hitler and his accomplices. It turned out that this man served in the SS troops. He personally killed Russians, Poles and Jews. The SS troops consisted of Ukrainian nationalists who did this dirty work. 
the president of Ukraine stood up with the entire parliament of Canada and applauded this man. How can this be imagined? The president of Ukraine himself, by the way, is a Jew by nationality. Really, my question is, what do you do about it? I mean, Hitler's been dead for 80 years. Nazi Germany no longer exists. And so, true. And so, I think what you're saying is you want to extinguish or at least control Ukrainian nationalism. But how? How do you do that? Послушайте меня. Ваш вопрос очень тонкий. Listen to me. Your question is very subtle, and I can tell you what I think. Do not take offense. Of course. This question appears to be subtle. It is quite pesky. You say Hitler has been dead for so many years, 80 years, but his example lives on. People who exterminated Jews, Russians and Poles are alive. And the president, the current president of today's Ukraine, applauds him in the Canadian parliament, gives a standing ovation. Can we say that we have completely uprooted this ideology if what we see is happening today? That is what the Nazification is in our understanding. We have to get rid of those people who maintain this concept and support this practice and try to preserve it. That is what denazification is. That is what we mean. Right. My question was a little more specific. It was, of course, not a defense of Nazis, neo or otherwise. It was a practical question. You don't control the entire country. You don't control Kiev. You don't seem like you want to. So how, how do you eliminate a culture or an ideology or feelings or a view of history in a country that you don't control. What do you do about that? You know, as strange as it may seem to you, during the negotiations at Istanbul, we did agree that we have it all in writing. Neo-Nazism would not be cultivated in Ukraine, including that it would be prohibited at the legislative level. Mr. Carson, we agreed on that. This, it turns out, can be done during the negotiation process. And there is nothing humiliating for Ukraine as a modern civilized state. Is any state allowed to promote Nazism? It is not, is it? Uh, that is it. <coughs> um, will there be talks and why haven't there been talks? about resolving the conflict in Ukraine, peace talks. They have been. They reached a very high stage of coordination of positions in a complex process, but still they were almost finalized. But after we withdrew our troops from Kiev, as I have already said, the other side threw away all these agreements and obeyed the instructions of Western countries, European countries and the United States to fight Russia to the bitter end. Moreover, the President of Ukraine has legislated a ban on negotiating with Russia. He signed a decree forbidding everyone to negotiate with Russia. But how are we going to negotiate if he forbade himself and everyone to do this? We know that he is putting forward some ideas about this settlement, but in order to agree on something, we need to have a dialogue. Is that not right? Well, but you wouldn't be speaking to the Ukrainian president, you'd be speaking to the American president. When was the last time you spoke to Joe Biden? I cannot remember when I talked to him. I do not remember. We can look it up. You don't remember? No. Why? Do I have to remember everything? I have my own things to do. We have domestic political affairs. Well, he's funding the war that you're fighting, so I would think that would be memorable. Well, yes, he funds, but I talked to him before the special military operation, of course. And I said to him then, by the way, I will not go into details, I never do, but I said to him then, I believe that you are making a huge mistake of historic proportions by supporting everything that is happening there in Ukraine by pushing Russia away. I told him, 
told him repeatedly, by the way. I think that would be correct if I stop here. What did he say? Ask him, please. It is easier for you, you are a citizen of the United States. Go and ask him. It is not appropriate for me to comment on our conversation. But, but, but you haven't spoken to him since before February of 2022.